Good morning, church. Uh, as we have uh, noted already the service, this is our last week in book three of the Psalms. We've been journeying through that together uh, this summer. And next week, we're going to resume uh, our study of the Gospel of John, uh, where we left off picking up in chapter 13 and continuing that through, throughout this year. So as we've journeyed through the Psalms, uh, especially book three, there are some key themes and events from the story of the Bible that the book assumes that we know as we're going through it, all right, that the Psalms come later in the Scriptures, and so it's building off a lot of key themes, events, major details that are there. And one of those key things is God's anointing of David as the king, and then God's covenant with David, his covenant being a promise that he will never break, that he will always be faithful to. And he makes this with David in 2 Samuel 7. And those promises, they are crucial to understanding the whole book of Psalms and then also to understanding our particular psalm, this very lengthy one that we're going to make it through this morning, Psalm 89. And so I want to begin our time with a brief flashback to the original story of God making his covenant with David. So remember the context of First and Second Samuel, which is uh, in the Hebrew Bible. It's one book together, just the book of Samuel. And the book right before it is Judges. And um, if you feel like book three of the Psalms has been a dark time, we'd say it could have been Judges, right? It could have been darker. Because this was a, a particularly dark time in their history. Sin and idolatry were rampant. The people were wicked and rebellious. And over and over again, they have to be rescued because of the, the consequences of their sin. And the author of the book gives us this very important refrain as to why things are as bad as they are in the land. And it's said in the final verse of the book, Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, it's interesting that the end of Judges could still be a commentary on much of what we see in our world and in our lives today. In those days, there's no king in the land, and so everyone's ruling themselves, and the results are catastrophic. And this leads immediately into the book of Samuel. Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel chapter 2 focuses on the hope of a coming anointed king that God is going to strengthen and exalt. In chapter 9, we have a potential fit for that king. We meet this guy named Saul. He is tall. He's rugged, handsome. He is a uh, person that looks like the kind of king we would want as humans. But he's a bad king. And this sets the stage for a young shepherd and musician named David. The Lord chooses him and anoints him. The Spirit of the Lord rests on him. And David is a good king. But he's still an imperfect king. As good as he is, he still has sin, and he too will die one day. And this all gets us to 2 Samuel 7 where David wants to build a house for the Lord, but the Lord responds that he's actually going to build a house and a name for David. And so God gives this covenant to him where he reiterates what he's already promised to Abraham in Genesis. So David's promised a great name. He's promised a place for God's people to dwell in security with God. And then in verses 12 through 16 of 2 Samuel 7, God turns to this promise concerning David's seed, his offspring from his line. And so let's read it together. He says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. So rich promises, huge promises here. God's going to establish the kingdom of David's son. God's going to be a father to him. He'll be a son to God. And here's that key detail. The kingdom is going to be established forever, never-ending, everlasting. So who is this talking about? Well, in one sense, we think of Solomon, 
who appears as an early candidate. We're told of his birth a few chapters later. His life and reign, they prove to be a partial fulfillment of some of these promises, but he fails in many ways too. Solomon has a divided heart. After his death, it leads to a divided kingdom to the point that it doesn't sound like the fulfillment of all these wonderful promises in 2 Samuel 7. It seems like much is left to be desired. So the prophets continue in the Bible to point towards this future king, this future son from David's line, who will fulfill these promises in full. We're told that this one will be anointed with the Spirit of God, that he will rule with righteousness and justice, that he will save his people, that because of his reign he will establish eternal peace, that he will destroy those who attack and oppose God and his people that he will also bear the iniquities of his people, Isaiah 53, and he will reign forever as the king of God's kingdom. So here's why all of that is so important to us here in the book of Psalms, is that, and just in our lives in general, is that all of our hopes are bound up in this covenant. Like all of our hopes are bound to these promises. Like this is God's plan to save a people for himself to establish his king over this people. If this isn't true, we're in trouble. We need these promises to be true, to be fulfilled. If we want to enjoy forgiveness of sin, resurrection from the grave, fellowship with God in his presence, life in a kingdom of perfect righteousness, we need this covenant to be true. We need God to be faithful to it. There is no backup plan. This is the plan. And This is why book three of the Psalms is so uh, sad and dark, why there's so many Psalms of lament. So I'll share one more time the illustration uh, of the book of Psalms as a whole that I put up last week. If you were here last week, you'll notice one adjustment to that. I felt like the valley looked a little too uh, green and happy and sunny, so we added some some storm clouds. (laughs) Uh, And and also, uh, this is to clarify, I think a few people thought it was a putt-putt golf course uh, initially. It's not, right? So forgive me for that. But again, this is a, a kind of a picture to illustrate the structure of the book of Psalms. So uh, one book, five books that compose it. Again, Psalms 1 and 2 are like the sun, the sky of the entire book, that the purpose and message of the whole book are given to us in these Psalms. And Psalm 2 in particular, it's a reflection on Second Samuel 7 and these promises to David. It points us to the hope of this king who will be a son of God who will rule over an everlasting kingdom. So books one and two, that first mountain, they're recalling these promises to David. And it ends in Psalm 72 on this mountain peak view of this ideal king and his kingdom and all the wonders of it. But all summer, again, we've been in book three, the valley. And that's because the setting of book three is one of sadness. David is off the, th- off the scene. He's no longer there. And the failure and sin of the people and of many of the kings that follow eventually lead to this judgment and exile from the land. So Psalm 88, we covered last week, it's the lowest point of the book. It's the, the pit, the cave, the, the, um, the place of darkness. And its final word is just darkness. There's not much sunlight coming through in Psalm 88. And today, in this final Psalm of Book 3, Psalm 89, it ends with Ethan the Ezraite struggling to make sense of how those glorious promises that were made to David long ago, how that matches up with the present situation that the people are in. Like, how can these go- coexist? How do these go together for you to say such wondrous things, and yet we have such a bleak situation? It seems instead to him like God has rejected the king and renounced the covenant. And yet he knows this isn't the case. So Psalm 89 is what it looks like for us to wrestle and pray when we know what uh, is true of God's character and his word isn't matching up or seeming to correspond with what we're experiencing in the present moment. Psalm 89 helps us to know how to pray and seek God in those moments, of which there are many in the Christian life. So we want to follow the lead of Ethan in the psalm, who goes through three key movements in his reflection that we'll trace. Singing of God's great promises, lamenting in the present darkness, and then longing for the restoration and return of the king and the fulfillment of God's promises. So let's walk through each of them together, learn from God's word this morning. We begin first with Ethan singing 
of God's covenant love and promises. So the bulk of the psalm, really the first 37 verses, it's a song of praise unto God. So let's just walk through it and note three things in particular that Ethan draws our attention to. The first is that God is to be praised for his everlasting love. Verses 1 through 4, he says, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. So keep your Bibles open as we, we go through Psalm 89, and notice the connections here between verse 1 and then verse 4. In verse 1, Ethan promises to sing of God's love forever, and then to make God's faithless, faithfulness known to all generations. And then in verse 4, he quotes God's promises to David to establish his seed forever and to build his throne for all generations. So key words that are tying it all together. And I think what we see is this is everlasting praise for an everlasting promise. God is to be praised for as long as his promises last and his promises last forever. He is always faithful. As long as God's throne and promise remains, we have reason to sing, no matter how dark it feels in the moment. And his dominion and praise never fail. You think about this, I hope this isn't a, a sore subject for a few people in here that are excited this time of year when the NFL comes back. But think about how long uh, fans get to celebrate their team as champions. Only as long as they're the champs, right? You only get to call yourselves the champs when you're the reigning champion. You, just, you don't get to boast in the glory days all the time. So let's remove this from, from ourselves a little bit. And I'm, I, again, apologize if this hurts anybody else's feelings today but you're probably in the minority. So let's imagine that a New York Yankees fan came in today to declare themselves the champions of the baseball world. It would be laughable. Some of you are already laughing. Even though they've won 27 titles in their history, right? Give them credit, most all time. They haven't won a championship in 15 years. <laughs> so you're not the champs. Neither are the Dallas Cowboys, right? That was yesterday. You aren't on the throne anymore. Even teams that have ridiculous runs of dominance and would be called a dynasty. Looking at you, Patriots fans, eventually the dynasty comes to an end. Maybe you needed the book, book three of the Psalms this, this time of year. But your team, your hero, they're only at the top for a moment, and then someone else takes over. This is the point, what we're seeing here. That's not the case with God. There's never a time where he's dethroned. There's never a time where his promises fail, where he's not the king, which means that as his people, we always have reason to sing and rejoice, to celebrate that our king reigns, even when it's difficult to say that. So Ethan sings of God's everlasting love, and so can we. Second thing we see is that God is to be praised for his incomparable greatness and salvation. So in the next section, which is uh, verses 5 through 16, he draws our attention to the universal praise that God receives. Both heaven and earth praise him. So verses 5 through 8, he's praised in heaven and by angelic beings. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Verse 6, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? It's a rhetorical question. No one, no one matches up with this description. It is only the Lord. Even among the most glorious created beings, they are nothing compared to the Creator because they are created, and he is not. They worship the true king in all his radiant splendor. The seraphim in Isaiah 6 have to cover their eyes before the Lord who dwells in unapproachable light. There is no one like him. And that's seen in his rule over creation in verses 9 through 10. Ethan says, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. 
You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. This is likely an allusion here to God's deliverance of his people uh, in Exodus through the Red Sea crossing. Rahab is identified elsewhere both as like a sea creature that's dragon-like and also uh, it's identified as the nation of Egypt. And so what I think we have here is a picture of the seed of the serpent going all the way back to Genesis that God has crushed. And God crushes the enemy, stills the waves of the sea with his hand. It is unimaginable power that we see on display here. This might seem like a really weird illustration for this, but it was on my mind recently. We told our kids about an ancient contraption from our childhood called the waterbed. <laughs> All right. did, anybody, did anybody in here have a waterbed mattress? Okay. <laughs> I want to ask if anybody still does. <laughs> it's like feeling nostalgic. Uh, I never did personally, but I was telling my kids about these things because um, one of my friends had it, and we would use the, the tops of their large toy boxes to surf on them. So one would push it on the end, make it have some waves, and, uh, and we, we were professional surfers, right? But the crazy thing is that if someone had uh, like a California king-size waterbed, and you filled that thing up. <laughs> don't, I, I don't know, don't put that on the, the second floor unless you really trust the structure of the house, right? This thing could weigh up to like 2,000 pounds. Super heavy. You imagine someone saying, hey, can you help me move a mattress? And you go, yeah. <laughs> you show up and it's a full waterbed mattress. Like, no, we're not doing this. Not happening. We can't even hold up the weight of a single mattress like that with all of our strength. That's how heavy water is. God can still the waves of the sea with a mere word. Think about that power. I tried, I was going to put the stat up of how heavy they estimate the water of the ocean is. You guys can go do that for yourself because I don't even know how to articulate the number that, that was given, right? It was the, that heavy. And so you can go find it and go, come on, man, you could, have, you could have put that. But it's crazy to think of the strength involved here, that the, he created it and he controls it. He is Lord over the sea, the earth, the universe. That's where Ethan takes us next in verses 11 through 12. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, these tall mountains, they joyously praise your name. God is the creator and owner of it all. He is the king. And in verses 13 through 14, Ethan reflects now on the kind of king he is. He says, you have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness, they go before you. It's not necessarily comforting to have a king that has the type of power we were just talking about, that type of unstoppable, universal power. If that king is evil, unjust, unloving, untrustworthy, that'd be a pretty terrifying reality to live under that. But the good news of our king is that with all of his power, what emanates from his throne are his perfect righteousness and justice, his steadfast love and faithfulness. These aren't things that occasionally characterize his throne. He doesn't stumble upon them. These are attributes of God that are his they are the very foundation of his throne. And so Ethan can say in verses 15 through 16, Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day and in your righteousness are exalted. I think the festal shout here, as the ESV translates it, it refers to joy, uh, Israel's joyful celebrations in response to God's mighty, act of, mighty acts of salvation. The type of celebration that you can have when you're on the other side of the Red Sea and you're singing in praise to God, or the type of celebration that would mark their festivals when they would remember God's deliverance of them. And he's saying, blessed are the people who know that. Blessed are the people who've been a part of the victory parade, <laughs> who have celebrated God's salvation of them, and who walk in his light. I think that walking in his light, it's an allusion back to the very first psalm, to Psalm 1, in the first verse of it, where the opposite is stated. Right? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. To follow that path is a path to death and destruction and darkness. 
following the way of the wicked is. It's like walking in the dark towards the edge of a cliff. It's like following a blind guide, navigating through the wilderness with a broken GPS. It's not going to lead you to safety. But those whose path is lit by the light of God's face, by his righteousness, his love, his character, those are the, the ones who are blessed. They rejoice in his name all the day, such that we are raised by his vindicating righteousness. And that's true for us as well, if we are in Christ. That true blessing, true joy, and true satisfaction, it comes to those who have turned to Christ in faith, who know God's gracious salvation, and who walk in the light as he is in the light. And so God is to be praised for his greatness, for his saving work, and then third, God is to be praised for this covenant that he's made with David. So verses 17 through 37, the core of the psalm, they serve as an extended reflection on God's covenant from 2 Samuel 7. And so just listen to these spectacular promises as we read through it. It says, For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea, and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever, and his throne As the days of the heavens. And then it turns in verse 30, something we'll come back to in a minute. It says, If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went from my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne, as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. That's a majestic picture, right? God's promises to David, they're they're remarkable. This king will be like no other king. He will be the highest of kings on the earth. He will be stronger than all the others, smarter than all the others, wiser than all the others, victorious over his enemies. He will experience God's steadfast love forever, and his throne will endure with a permanency that can only be described as the permanency of the sun and the moon and the sky. As reliable as they are every day for us, his throne will be all the more permanent. It is spectacular. We could marvel at each of these lines individually if we had time. But what I want you to see is that these promises, they anticipate two key things. First, it anticipates the failure of David's sons. So look back in verses 30 through 33, I mentioned, where it literally says, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with the stripes, but I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. This is the story of what happens after David. It's what led to the exile in the darkness of book three. The occupants of the throne, they were often unfaithful. They didn't keep God's word. And this transgression is punished. Exile happens. It is horrific. But God's love is not abolished in the process. And that leads us to see the second thing anticipated here, and that is the faithfulness of God to raise up a particular son of David who is going to fulfill these promises. We know the one who ultimately fits this glorious description in Psalm 89. When God sent his son to be born in the line of David, Jesus is declared to be both the son of God 
and the son of David. He is truly the firstborn, as Paul calls him in Colossians 1. He is the king of kings. He is the one who is faithful to every word of God, and he is the one who crushes the enemy, but in a pretty remarkable way. It's by being crushed, by becoming a curse for those who were under a curse so that we might be saved. Though Jesus never failed, though he never sinned, he is the one who receives the rod of God's righteous punishment for our sin. Our iniquity was laid on him. By his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53. And so it anticipates this coming king. This is the first movement. If we stopped here, this wouldn't be a psalm of sadness. This would be a psalm of great celebration. <laughs> There's a lot to be, uh, to, to be sung and praised there. But as the psalm continues, the song takes a dark turn. We could say that the rest of it's in a minor key as we find Ethan lamenting the stunning rejection of the king. So verse 38 is like it's the screeching of a record. If you like the song, this is going to be tough on the ears. It's a massive turn where the glorious promises of old that have all been mentioned, they only serve to throw light on how grim the present situation is. From the perspective of the exile, it looks and feels like God has forsaken his king, that he has renounced his promises. So pick up in verses 38 through 45 and take in again this tragic description. He says, but now you have cast off and rejected. You were full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. You have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword, and you have not made him stand in battle. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth. You have covered him with shame. It's really the exact opposite of everything we read up to verse 37. Rather than experiencing God's steadfast love, it feels like God's wrath lays heavy on the anointed king. Rather than fulfilling the covenant, it seems like God has renounced it. Rather than exalting the king's strength, it seems that God has exalted the strength of the enemy, leading to their defeat. Rather than the Davidic king being honored above all kings, this king, he is, his crown is defiled. He is mocked and scorned by all. Rather than a glorious and everlasting kingdom, this king is cut down in his youth. He is covered with shame. And this reality grieves Ethan and cuts to his heart that this disconnect between God's promises of old and the present suffering, it's so devastating it leads him to these questions in verses 46 through 48, where he says, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity have you created all the children of man? What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Like many of the Psalms we've seen in this book, uh, this is raw. It's also a profound prayer. So what Ethan reveals is that he knows God has not abandoned his promises. Right? You can see that implied here. He believes this day of salvation will come. But he also recognizes the brev- brevity of his own life. So the suffering seems to him to be never-ending, and he longs for the promises to be fulfilled, but if he had it his way, they'd be fulfilled in his day. (laughs) It's like, I'm running out of time here to see this restoration happen. Remember how short my time is. How long is this going to take for you to act and fulfill these promises? Because he wants to experience it. And here are a few things I think we should learn from these verses in particular. For one, this part of the prayer it also anticipates the arrival of that future son of David. We see that here. Though it seems that God had rejected the king and renounced the covenant, he had not. He had not renounced it. He was going to be faithful to it. But the fulfillment of these words does come to pass through the king who was rejected for our sake, who did become a curse, who was slain by his enemies, mocked by all who passed him on the road, cut down in his youth through the most shameful form of execution we could imagine, of crucifixion as a criminal. Our iniquity and shame and sin, it was laid on him. 
the wrath of God was absorbed by him so that through his rejection on the cross, we might be spared the wrath of God that we deserve and we might be accepted. And so we praise the Lord for that. We see how Jesus comes to fulfill this. But a second point of application here is that Psalm 89, it provides an example for how we might cry out to God when we experience, when our experience rather, it doesn't seem to match up with our expectations from his word. We've seen this already. Think about verses uh, 17 through 37 in particular, that the way that Ethan starts off is just by quoting God's word to him in his prayer. He just prays back the promises of God's word. He prays back 2 Samuel 7 because he believes it to be true. He knows that God is going to be faithful. And so he is seeking God on the basis of God's own promises. And we would be wise to do the same. That we bring these before the Lord. We see the glorious promises of Christ's kingdom. We see the promises of a new creation. We know the promises that we celebrate in light of the resurrection, that we will have new bodies who aren't, that aren't subject to sin and suffering and decay and death. Grief will be no more. Tears will be no more. And then we wake up and it's Monday again. The world is broken. Tragedies and suffering abound left and right. We're still broken and sinful. We long for things that will kill us rather than trusting the Lord at all times. We're dying. We have a date with death. And one of the recurring questions of the Psalms that it's okay to cry in desperation to the Lord is how long? <laughs> how long? Because those words, when they're uttered in faith, they reveal that our hearts yearn for what's to come. They yearn for God's promises to be fulfilled. They yearn for Christ and his kingdom. More than anything this world can offer, we say, this doesn't satisfy, Lord. So how long until you return? <laughs> how long until evil is eradicated from this world and from me, from within my heart? How long until we get to be with you forever and enjoy you like you promised? How long will it seem like you've hidden your face? Because we believe that in your presence there is fullness of joy. There are pleasures forevermore. And so we learn how to pray in the valley, in the darkness. And that takes us to the final movement where the psalmist is yearning for that as well and longing for the return and restoration of the king. So verse 49, he continues with another question at the heart of the issue. He says, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Again, he believes it still exists. It's still there, but he can't see it presently. So he calls on God in verse 50 with this prayer. Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked and how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. And so see here that the call for God to remember that Ethan roots that in the honor of God's own name. When God's king is mocked, when God's people are mocked and persecuted, it is his faithfulness and power and love and reputation that are ultimately being called out by the nations. I love Spurgeon and his commentary on this. He just says briefly, when Jehovah's own name is in the quarrel, surely he will arise. He will vindicate the holiness of his name and he will save his people. Even more, look at the final verse, the final line of verse 51 rather. So in the ESV, it reads that they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Uh, that's probably because the, the most literal way to translate it, it sounds a little funky, that they reproach the heels of your anointed. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if you got your heels mocked this week, um, but that's, that's the way that it reads. I think it's really important because it's, I, I believe it's an allusion to Genesis 3.15, where God promises that the heel of the seed of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. It will crush the enemy. And it's like that promise is being called into question and mocked. Like the heel of God's anointed king isn't dangerous at all. And Ethan calls upon God to remember these promises, to crush the head of the serpent, the enemy, to vindicate his people for his glory. And so his prayer then resolves into the blessing of verse 52 that closes both Psalm 89 and book 3. And blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. So we're at the end of book three. <laughs> I think it's helpful for us in light of that to take a step back 
and to ask what our response should be, not just to Psalm 89, but also to this entire section of Psalms that are born out of the valley of darkness and suffering and waiting, of delayed expectations. So two questions would just ask you in closing. The first being simply, do you know King Jesus? Do you know this King? As we said in the beginning, there's no question more important than that one because all of our hopes, all of our hopes of forgiveness, of life, of salvation, of resurrection, they are tied directly to this King. There is no other way to experience forgiveness of sin, reconciliation, and fellowship with God, eternal life in His presence. There's no backup plan. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the King of Kings. And the good news for us, again, is that this all-powerful, perfectly righteous, sovereign King who has every right and reason to crush us in our sin and rebellion, that the good news is that He was instead crushed for our rebellion. He became a curse so that we might be declared righteous before God, clothed in His righteousness. He experienced the rejection, suffering, and death that we deserve so that we could be saved and raised to everlasting life. And so hear both the warning and the invitation once more of Psalm chapter 2, verses 10 through 12 says this at the end, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, meaning give your allegiance to Him, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. So that's the question today. Have you taken refuge in the Son? Have you turned to Him for life and salvation? And then a second question, if you have, you belong to him, dark times still come. And so how will you respond in the valley, in times of darkness, in times of waiting? This is the test of faith that the Psalms of Lament bring to our attention time and time again. It's easy to follow Jesus when it always results in immediate, tangible blessings that we can tie right back to our obedience. That's great. <laughs> It's a lot more difficult when we're obeying Him and we're trying to be faithful and we're reading His Word and we're praying and we're not seeing those immediate blessings when suffering comes and it disorients us and it leaves us in the darkness. So what will your response be in those times? Will you be found faithful, trusting God, or will you be found faithless? Meaning, will you turn to other sources, to other places, to other gods, to other um, to other people looking for salvation, looking for deliverance in life, or will you keep running to the Lord alone as the God of your salvation? Book three of the Psalms calls us to be found faithful, that even when we struggle to see it, we keep going to Him because we believe there's nowhere else to go. He alone is Lord. Likewise, the Psalms teach us that in the darkness, we must be those who seek the Lord in prayer. These are prayers born from suffering, and so what about us? In those moments, are we more typically found to be silent, to turn away from the Lord? Or will we be those who seek God day and night in urgent prayer, believing that He hears us, and according to His wisdom and timing and love, He will act for our good and His glory? And so let us be found prayerful as well. And finally, a major theme of this section has been the call to remember who God is, what He has done, and what He has promised, regardless of how difficult it is to see those realities in the present. When we're in the valley, will we be found as a forgetful people who act like God's never been there for us, right? Who act like life before the Lord was better than we can imagine. We become like the Israelites in the wilderness, talking about meat pots to the full in Egypt, we forget God's faithfulness to us, or will we be those who discipline ourselves to meditate on the Word day and night, to remember who God is, to remember what He's done, to remember His promises, to remember the assurance of His love, His faithfulness, and the salvation that He's already provided us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and He's promised the kingdom that will be established in full at His return. So what does it look like to do that? Meaning, what does it look like to call to remembrance these things as a way of making it 
when we're experiencing times of difficulty. I was thinking this week that, that Paul's words in Romans 8, 31 through 39, that famous section, it's such an example of what this looks like. And so I'll read it for us in closing this morning. And Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. This sounds like book three of the Psalms. All of these things are coming upon people. They come upon us in our life. All of these things that happen in the valley, in the darkness. Will these things separate us from the love of Christ, he asked. Verse 37, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray and thank him for that truth and ask him to help us remember it. Father, we thank you for the good news that we have to celebrate that even though often in this life, as we await the return of, of your son Jesus, we experience times of darkness, of tragedy, of, of heartache, and, and it can be a real challenge to know these glorious truths and promises of your word and then to, to not be fully there yet, to still be waiting for the full consummation of this kingdom. And so would you help us afresh today to not in those moments turn away from you, to be faithless, prayerless, to abandon you as our only hope, as our fountain. Would you help us to keep coming back to you, to keep seeking you, trusting you, praying to you, and remembering all of your faithfulness to us in the past and the present and your faithfulness to us in the future, that nothing can separate us Nothing in all creation can take us away from your love, that you keep your people, you hold us in your hand for all eternity. And we have that assurance today. So Father, I pray for any here who do not have that assurance, who have not turned to your son in faith and taken refuge in them. Would you help them to just feel the gravity of the words that we've read today, of the life and death reality before us, that there is no salvation, no life outside of King Jesus. And yet, by grace, you sent your Son to take on our humanity, to take on our sin, to die in our place, to rise again so that we might know you. And so would you call them to yourself today if they have not taken refuge in Jesus? And would you help us, Father, to remember your love, to remember your covenant faithfulness, especially now as we ready our hearts for the taking of the Lord's Supper, a time that you have given to us to do in remembrance of all that you've accomplished through Christ and all that you will accomplish through him. And so may this be a time where we are nourished, where we put our sin to death and turn from it, and we turn again in faith and love and allegiance to you. For you alone give life. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen.